So when having healthy organizational culture comes with, you know, being incredibly, you know, values driven. So what I see in many companies is the CEO and CEO minus one are stating again, what the, they aspire for the organization um, to be in that culture, but then aren't really living to towards those values. So it's that it's, I'm a big proponent for having diversity um, and a sense of inclusion and belonging within the workplace. I mean, that's, I, I hate that I often am educating that it's not just the right sort of like moral imperative, but the reality is it's actually very good for business, whether it's problem solving, innovation, the employee engagement that drives productivity, top and bottom line, et cetera. So Welcome to the People Powered Solutions Podcast. In this show, you'll gain expert advice and tips on building a thriving workplace culture with happy employees. I'm your host, Lorianne Duguay, and I'm thrilled to be spending this time with you today. Hello, and welcome to another episode of People Powered Podcast. Today, we welcome Victoria Peltier, an expert, a professional speaker, an expert in her field, but I will not speak any longer about her. I will let her do the talking. So welcome, Victoria. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here speaking with you and your listening audience. Awesome. How about you share with our audience how Victoria got to doing what Victoria does? I'm going to have to find a really condensed way to do that because I feel really, really old when I realize that I've actually been in the corporate world for 30 years now. And so what I will tell you is best laid plans and going with the flow and pivoting is something I've embraced fully. I thought I was going to be a lawyer. But I worked for a bank while I was in university and running operations and got recruited out at age 24 to be the COO for an outsourced contact center environment, business process outsourcing or BPO for short. And that began my foray into the role of B2B professional services, my first executive role. And I just realized I love the complexity. I love the leadership of those teams. And that's where I have stayed ever since. And then in addition to that, I sit on multiple boards. As you said, I do public speaking, authored um, a few books, and then fitness fanatic, wife, mother. I refer to myself as a multi-potentialite given all the different like interests I have. In our preliminary conversation, we talked about just leadership in general and, and keeping in mind that our audience is primarily either in a leadership position for educating, supporting the leadership team. So that being said, a few there's there's a few things that I like this show to provide to our audience. We like our audience to leave with something they can implement the minute they walk away from the episode. Although we're recording this on the Friday, depending on when it airs, you might not be walking away and doing it right away. But anyways, nonetheless, can you talk a bit about you? You mentioned that you enjoyed and really liked the way that the leadership ran their teams within those that that environment. What was it specifically about their approach to leadership that really resonated with you? It was the role of leadership that I love so much. Okay. And why I decided not to pursue a legal career and stay in the in the corporate world as a leader. I love the opportunity to impact other people, focus on their development, marrying their personal goals and objectives with what they do for work every day, connecting it deeply to purpose. Now, what I will say though, Lori, is I had, I'm going to say in many instances, horrible examples of leaders, but that fueled me because I was determined I'd be nothing like them. And I made some pretty significant mistakes early in my career because I stepped into that first exec role at 24, new mother, only woman at the table, part of the LGBT community. I felt like I wasn't sure that I belonged there and I was all business all the time. By the way, something, and you and I were joking about that, I still battle with today. I'm ready to dive right into the agenda all the time. But I got a nickname as the Iron Maiden and which crushed me to my core. I mean, I have delivered amazing business results and I'd say that people liked me, but they probably feared me. So I had to learn to lead differently and show up in a very different way. And that in itself, that growth and challenge in the way I lead has continued to energize me and push me forward. Amazing. Amazing. And, and so much about what you just mentioned, I want to dig a bit deeper into. So the first thing I'd like to dig a bit deeper is throughout your career, you were exposed to, you know, what I coin as, I don't even call them leaders. I feel like they don't, they don't 
warrant a leadership title. They're bad bosses, essentially, where, you know, so what specifically, let, let's talk about some of the attributes that you absolutely did not want to embody in the leader that you would become. So what were some of those attributes that you wanted to veer away from? Well, the first was I ended up leaving that first executive role after a couple of years when I uncovered fraud um, within the business, a couple of members of my own team, which I was able to terminate them, but one of the co-founders. And I remember going to the CEO whom I reported to and unhappy with that, but he wasn't prepared to take action, buy him out, do something. And I, as the, I led all functions of that organization as their COO, except for finance. And I said, my face is here. I'm very much representing the company and I'm not prepared to remain. I'm incredibly values and integrity driven. So that was just exam one example. Another more recently over the last number of years was the enablement of what I refer to as the toxic top performers. So because they sell in the business and they make money, but we enable their really crappy behavior, language, and actions. And so I remember going forward to, I was running a very large practice for business unit for this one company. And this was a sales executive who had to engage with my team. And it, he would be the type who'd cancel meetings two minutes before people were due to show up, reschedule it without checking people's schedules. When he wasn't happy with people's work, he would tell them that they were wasting his business development dollars. It wasn't worth the you know time and energy. Like he was just swear at them, horrible. And I remember going to my leader at the time um, and saying like, this is not appropriate. He was a direct report to her, but protected by some others in the business. So I said, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to control what I can control. And if you're not prepared to deal with him, and there'd been multiple HR investigations, if you're not prepared to exit him after all of this time, then my team will never work on any deal that he is engaged in. And I know he needs my team. So he's either going to have to show up in a very different way and demonstrate that for them to come back in. So it's things like that for, for me, um, where the that exemplify the bad bosses that you talk about. And, and so I'll do everything in my control to make change to that. And where I can't touch those leaders themselves, then I'm going to protect my team in a very different way. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that behavior, that last example that you just provided, I've been exposed to it time and time again, right? This, this notion of tolerating bad behavior and allowing it, because let's be really frank, odds are that leader is intimidated by, you know, their direct report, whoever it is having that behavior, the behavioral issues. But at the end of the day, tolerating it, transmit a whole other message to the rest of the team. And allowing that to persist is also speaking volumes to the rest of the team. It's just, I've also been in those types of environments. My example of, of what fueled me, I loved when you said it fueled you to, you know, become the leader that you became my example is literally what fueled me to my purpose of doing the work I do, of ensuring that I help create many healthy workplace cultures as I can. And one of those examples of the bad bosses was a peer who then became my manager. And just that that whole transition rather than, you know, just let's talk this through. Let's talk about how this might change the dynamics of our working relationship. It became very posturing. Like, I'm the boss. You do what I say because I say so. You're not to question it. And they started running with assumptions of how I would behave in light of them getting this promotion. And they were all assumptions, but then their behavior was directly correlated with these assumptions. So, you know, I... I there was nothing I could have done that would have resonated with them as a boss because they'd already decided how I would be, right? So so definitely, audience, if you are someone who is either being exposed to that kind of a boss, then definitely take a page from, but you're in a, a still in a leadership position, take a page from Victoria and make sure that you defend and you protect your team from the impact of tolerating kind of the whoever's being tolerated. But on the flip side, if you are with someone who has uh, any attributes that you know are not conducive to effective leadership, to healthy leadership, then it's on you to try and figure out how you can work either with your boss to help improve on that situation 
or to have a conversation, a really frank conversation directly with that person to help them understand. Most of the time, they don't even know that they're doing what they're doing and it's landing the way it is. So you need to have that very frank conversation of help me understand your perspective on this one. Help me understand why you're coming at it this way. That usually gets them a little um, diffused to some extent and they'll have a much better conversation. Okay, so thank you for sharing those examples of bad bosses and they inspired, right? Which was a good thing. I, I always say nothing happens to us, everything happens for us. So that being said, those bosses were put in our path to fuel where we are today. Okay, so you also talked about the importance of authentic leadership. Help us understand what that means. So as I said, I I had to relearn, and actually, I don't even know, I, that's probably not the right word, Lori, to say relearn. I had to show up very differently. And I recognized that I showed up in a particular way as a leader. I thought I needed, as I said earlier, to be all business all the time. I've got business outcomes and shareholders that I need to satisfy. I've been through 18 mergers and acquisitions in my career, making lots of restructuring decisions, synergy, cost takeout. I'm effective at that. But people, one, never saw the emotion. And they didn't see it for a few reasons. One, I come from a very traumatic childhood experience. And so I learned, was very effective as a child putting up walls to protect myself. And so I didn't want to give people the opportunity to see that I was too emotional or vulnerable. I also, as a young woman in business, and even now as an older woman in business, the, you know, the vernacular that comes with being too emotional as a woman in business. So for all of those reasons, I didn't show up that way. And so for me, authenticity meant... I needed to lean into what made me really uncomfortable. And that meant talking about some of my feelings and emotions. And it also meant sharing some more of my lived experiences and saying, this is the place that I came from. That's my why. That's what fuels me and why I'm so driven. So when I, you need to tell me sometimes to slow down and catch up, but I want you to know where that, where that place comes from. And so being able to share more of those stories, being that, that's what I mean by being authentic it means like, let's show our true selves. Like let's, you know, we, we can honor the fact that we've had a crappy weekend or crappy circumstances and we might therefore have a really poor business day. Like let's, let's be okay talking about that. Yeah. Uh, and then um, that also built, you know, builds trust and rapport with our teams. And ultimately I was people... about to say, Hey, are you familiar with the five B's with the five behaviors, Patrick Lencioni? No. Five, five behaviors of a high performing team. So I happen to have a little, <laughs> a little pyramid here. So <laughs> like to Maslow's pyramid of your needs, the human needs. So this is at the very foundation is trust. And when we talk about trust as being that foundational piece of a high performing team, it's not the trust, you know, if you fall, I will catch you predictable kind of trust. No, it's that vulnerable trust. It's that normalizing being human, that saying, you know what, and exactly the story you just shared, this is why I tend to approach things like that. But you know what, I can, I get that this won't land the same way with everyone. So if it's too much, please stop me. I give you permission to stop me and to say, Hey, can we, can we slow down the pace here? Right. And to have those conversations to develop that level of openness and transparency amongst team members can be game changing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So just the other four behaviors is, you know, once we've got trust down pat, We've got conflict or lack there, lack of allowing conflict and mm. these this notion of avoiding conflict and wanting to avoid it at all costs, but also not allow it, not to allow healthy debate, not to understand the value of conflict, because at the end of the day, you know what? It's inevitable. It's happening. You're conflicted within yourself. When your head's saying one thing, your heart's saying something else. What are the odds that you can avoid conflict the minute you multiply perspective, you multiply approaches to work, priorities? Come on, it's happening. So it's important for them to train the, that that high performing team is one that will embrace conflict and will transform the experience of conflict from a destructive to a productive one. How could we grow from this? How could we learn from this? Then we've got commitment where, you know, people are, are signing up for stuff. Um, within within the organization, within the team. And because there's that vulnerability, there's that trust that they, or they're they okay with debate. There's that next level of accountability saying, hey, you put your hand up for that. It's not happening. What's going on? Help me understand what's going on here. 
And at the very top, of course, it's just results. And, and, and that focus of the low performing is focused on individual results. The high performing understands the collective results. I felt the need for the audience to go through the five Bs, the five behaviors and high performing teams. It's like kind of just tease them with the balance ones. But sorry, this show is for you, not for you to get it long winded. But the whole point was to say, yes, 100%, that vulnerability, that authenticity is what will drive the high performance, what will drive the level of trust. You need to, as a leader, model the behavior you seek in your team. Exactly. Right? Absolutely. So let's talk about some of the, from a culture perspective, because it sounds like you have been in a number of different work environments, a number of different teams. What is it that you've seen over time that seems to drive that healthier culture? So I'm a believer that culture is the outcome of not just the fancy mission statement that we put on the wall of what we aspire yeah. for our culture to be, the policies and the procedures in the, you know, in the business, but from a leadership perspective, it's the language, the actions and the behavior and way, way in which we show up and the connectedness to purpose. And I see that particularly since COVID, there's much more of a need, particularly as there's no separation, as many people are still working remotely, or at least in a hybrid environment, no separation that they want to gain much more purpose. So when having healthy organizational culture comes with, you know, being incredibly, you know, values driven. So what I see in many companies is the CEO and CEO minus one are stating again what the they aspire for the organization um, to be in that culture, but then aren't really living to towards those values. So the example I shared of that toxic high performer would be a great example. Let's not state that we have this aspirational culture if we're prepared for those kind of leaders to continue to exist despite multiple HR, you know, investigations, lawsuits, et cetera. So it's that it's, I'm a big proponent for having diversity um, and a sense of inclusion and belonging within the workplace. I mean, that's, I, I hate that I often am educating that it's not just the right sort of like moral imperative, but the reality is it's actually very good for business, whether it's problem solving, innovation, the employee engagement that drives productivity, top and bottom line, et cetera. So that's an element. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's no one, like I, I spend a lot of time in, you know, human capital businesses, leading HR and workforce strategy, consulting, technology and outsourcing, but all, you know, the, you know, to, for the workforce of other customers. And I tell like, there's, there's no magic bullet here right? It's a culmination of a, a multitude of like facets that we need to look at and the need to, here's my phrase, being strategically intentional about whether it's leadership, actions, language, behavior, whether it's our DEI, you name it. We need to be strategically intentional of how we move that forward and consistent. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when you talked about purpose and impact, it is one of the 10 needs that I cover, right? In my book, it's purpose and impact. People want to know that the work they do makes a difference. Two big kind of, I guess, mistakes that organizations make. One, you talked about the CEO and, and, you know, minus one. They decide what the vision, mission, and values are. They have decided, and here you go, they prescribe it. Rather than involve the organization, involve, get representation from all levels of the organization and having them devise, you know, what is it we're here for? What is it we're working towards? And what do we promise to uphold as we navigate our journey towards that bigger picture, towards that bigger goal, right? But then also where they fail on the second front is they don't help team members connect to that vision. They don't help them understand how, although I might be feeding a machine day in, day out, that's all I'm doing, I'm feeding a machine, but feeding that machine is actually enabling the achievement of that broader picture. Here's how it connects to that. And helping them understand that is where they're going to move away from feeling like they're just a number to feeling value seen and heard. They know the work they do makes a difference and is changing the lives of others externally, perhaps as well. So how are you showcasing as an organization, you know, what it is you're working towards and the, the difference that it's having in the lives of others to convey that level of purpose and impact, but also how are you helping your internal customers, which in my opinion are the most important, understand and connect to that right? So definitely, I agree that it's one, it's no one size fits all. It's, it's, it is absolutely kind of multifaceted, but purpose and impact 
and DEI, huge, huge, huge components. And we, you kind of ran through them really quickly, but I think there is so many organizations who fail to recognize the value of diversity. And being where I am up here in Northern Ontario, I mean, everybody is working against this dwindling talent pool, right? Of course, but we need to get really creative. And of course, I'm always the number one champion of, well, how about you recreate your culture to attract that next generation of workers? But honestly, I live in a rural area of Canada where we already have snow, the lake has frozen over. Not everybody wants to move up here. So we're having to recruit abroad. We're having to really get creative with our recruitment strategies to get people here. And if organizations and companies could just embrace the value of that diversity of people coming from all hails of life, people coming from different cultures, different countries, and how that can really breed innovation, it would be game changing. And I say this because I was speaking to a local, like a municipal representative. And I said, okay, they're doing their strategic planning. So they consulted just to see from a talent attraction, what should we be focusing on? Where do you think there's going to be some evolution in the future? And when I mentioned the importance of, you know, getting a bit creative and looking abroad and not necessarily uh, limiting ourselves to the pool within a certain geographic area, I got pushback. And I was like, really? And it's, oh, they, they could never survive up here. And they were running under all of these assumptions right hmm. away that people from outside our area could never survive our reality. How about we reframe that? How about we make ourselves so enticing that suddenly they want to come up here, that they're willing to brave the cold? And, and you know what? Some people might be fed up of the heat and they want to come towards the cold. I don't know. So, <laughs> so definitely the importance of getting creative. Let's talk a bit more about DEI and, you know, why you think it's important, but also how how do how can organizations actually create those types of communities within their ranks? So the why it's important we've we've talked about in terms of yes, it's the right thing to do, the right moral moral imperative, but it's just it's proven there is data that supports how beneficial it is in business. So how do we achieve this? Go back to strategic intentionality. Although I do think you need to understand your baseline. The place in which you're starting from, and then you know, building a, a bar, moving in, in terms of how you're going to move the needle forward. But recognizing diversity is much more than the things we can currently capture today. You know, so there's HR systems are ca capturing depending on where in the world you are, but gender is almost everywhere. And then it's optional self disclosure for many other elements of whether that's sexuality, whether that's your race religion, disability status, veteran status, all of those. But so as leaders, it's recognizing the multitude of dimensions to diversity and inter intersectionality of those. You know, so I'm a woman. I'm part of the LGBT community. I was married to a woman before now being married to my husband. I have a trans child. So there's intersect. I come from a very difficult you know, background. I'm a Canadian who lives, by the way, in a very warm place now in Southern Florida. And, you know, so there's all these things. So just recognize that. But also there's the type of job diversity. So being, I, I hate, I have a love-hate relationship with recruiters in that they're often incredibly myopic. It's like, I'm going, I'm hiring for this company for this job, and I'm going to find someone who's had that title at one of the competitors. And rather than looking at skills and experience that are readily transferable into those roles, recognizing that, you know, every company is a technology company now. We're all digitally enabled in the way in which we do our work. So looking outside of that to gain the skills, maybe in healthcare in, in this particular, to a different kind of consumer space. So that's one thing. To your point around the geographic piece and finding people who I, I think of. So again, we're both Canadian. And I just think of like the number of people who admire the Canadian culture, the benefits of having a social health care system and all of those things. So I can't tell you how many people I've supported coming over from India where, you know, it's 50 degrees Celsius in the summertime there who are going to trade that for, I don't know, they like minus 50 that you might have where you are, but with, wind, with quite, the wind with the wind <laughs> with the wind the 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 Arctic here, come on. <laughs> but who will trade that in and maybe they don't want it forever, but they want it for a period of time and they want to gain those experience. And so I encourage leaders to open their mind to what diversity means and not that it, again, it's not just about gender, race, sexuality, and then inclusion and belonging. So it means creating 
policies and procedures that make people feel like there's a sense of belonging, that they can show up as their authentic self. They don't need to be afraid of like the home cooked food that they're going to bring to the, you know, to the lunchroom and what that might mean. And so it's creating that kind of environment, having, you know, employee resource groups. So other people can come together with common experiences, but also share that more broadly within, with the rest of their, their coworkers. Having a strategy, right? Be strategically intentional means it, it entails you have a strategy, you have a plan to assure that level of diversity and inclusion. You touched on two things I want to I want to revisit. Recruitment, it's so interesting. The example you used is perfect. I'm working with a client right now with a company, and they're having, they were, I always get them to, and it's two things you said. I always get them to measure first. Understand where you're at right now. Like how, what are some of the things that you're currently doing? And let's look at metrics and let's see how you know, how that's actually performing for you. And then we decided, we recognized that their time to hire was really lengthy. So I said, okay, so we need to figure out what's the recruitment process like, let's map that out. And so one of the big issues was that the hiring manager was having these kind of changing requests. So it would start with, here's my, the the position I need to recruit for. They're going straight to the job description. They're saying the ideal candidate must have experience, three to five years experience must be in the province. And they were eliminating, first of all, people who didn't even work in the province. And I'd say, why? They'd say, well, they won't relocate here. I'm like, that's a bit of an assumption. A lot of people are looking to relocate these days, right? So they're like, oh yeah, that's true. I'm like, and then what happens? Well, we bring candidates and they're never good enough. And and then they decide, well, but they need to have this, that, and the other thing. I said, okay, so this beautiful dance can take three months is what I'm hearing. But yeah, okay. So we're going to develop uh, requisition form, super easy. I'm all about very easy, very like specific. We're going to have a requisition form that's going to trigger recruitment. They're going to submit it to the HR department to say, I want to hire. The questions on that submission form are going to look like this. What would a successful candidate look like in this position? What would they do? What would uh, you know a non-successful candidate look like? What would they be doing? What are some of the challenges you're hoping this candidate will contribute to solving? Where where might where have you hired candidates who like from which school, what association in the past that were successful in this position? And all the questions are really about developing that profile of an ideal candidate, not the profile that matches a job description. What is that ideal candidate? What do they actually do? And that includes soft skills. Are they okay to, you know, juggle more than one priority at a time? Uh, do they need to be very agile? Do they need to be, you know, or comfortable with routine to the other extreme of that? They need to, it's going to be very routine. Like, understand what are some of the, the, the tendencies and, and some of the attributes that you're trying to get out of that ideal candidate? Define that at the onset so that you can be more strategic with your recruitment. And one of the reasons I have them ask, you know, where do people like this? Are there associations that govern people in this this area of work are there colleges or or regulatory bodies because we can be sourcing people from there rather than just posting a job and hoping for the best like it's again about being strategically intentional on what kind of person you want in that position but now let's be a bit creative in where we're going to source it and you're right that a lot of the recruiters are very myopic they 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 focus on just one one profile and and they're seeking to fill a job description and not an actual person which comes back to your whole human thing. So absolutely. Diversity of experience is the second piece I want to touch on. I love that. And I think that um, that transferability is really important. And to understand that if you've been having challenges within your team and those same challenges keep coming up, but you're always hiring that same profile with people with the same experience, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. That's right. Put it right. Like just, just how about you look for what is it that which other, um, and and specifically one of the examples that's come to mind is a client who they're manufacturing, but they're very niche manufacturing, and so they were looking for people from that ex- who have experience in that field, and I was like, really? Do you know that? What is it exactly that you feel that someone in that field will have knowledge of that in another field they might not? And everything was soft skills. So it was about helping them reframe the way they think about these kinds of things. And let's be clear, audience, I do not do recruitment. (laughs) It's it's just in mapping out. Well, what I do when I work with organizations, we map out their employee journey 
And that includes, of course, attraction and trying to get people through into the interview. And then it moves on to onboarding, orientation, performance development, all that beautiful stuff. So, so just a few tips that we've provided to clients over time that has really changed the way they approach their recruitment, but also help them embrace the importance of being very intentional about being diverse and being completely equitable as well as inclusive. From I'm looking at the time here. I am way over, I think. I, I, I said to Victoria at the beginning, I usually run about 25, 30 minutes. There's certain instances where I end up having to make it longer and really, but like, I make it longer because I talk too much. So this feels like it's one of those instances. Victoria, if you had one kind of nugget of wisdom that you wanted our audience to walk away with today, what would that be? So I have these two like hashtags I sign off the majority of my social media posts with. One is unstoppable. And that's kind of just my philosophy and mantra. And that you can, and, and for, for me, that means there's no obstacle, you know, challenge that will prevent me from getting to my goal or objective. And the other is no excuses, which my children don't love so much. But <clears throat> it's not that we don't have feelings and emotions when something comes up. We it, What it means for me is we have choices in terms of how we are going to move forward. So as you said, most of your listeners our leaders, HR professionals, those that are perhaps coaching other leaders. And in those two things, you know, you're the CEO of you and whether that's your brand, how you show and how you show up and how you lead. And you have the ability to make choices that we're dealing in looming recessionary you know, conditions. The world is a bit crazy right now, but we have a choice in terms of how we are going to show up and how we are going to lead. And yes, there's going to be challenge and adversity we're dealing with. But again, it's that choice that we have in terms of how we want to move forward. And for me, that's part of the goal and objective and the unstoppable is thinking about the legacy and the impact that I want to have and making sure that the how I show up and how I act and talk every day is aligned to that. Love it. Listeners, all of you woke up this morning, but not all of you recognized and realized that you were all CEOs. I love what I just heard there. We are all CEOs of ourselves which means we all have choices to make. So absolutely aligned with what Victoria is sharing here. Make sure that those choices align with the vision you have for yourself. And if you don't have a vision, let's start there. Develop your vision. Understand what success looks like for you as a person, what your life looks like in a way that you're feeling happy, fulfilled five years down the road, then make the choices that align with vision. Thank you so much, Victoria. If our audience wants to continue connecting with you, how could they go about doing that? The best way to do that is I have a website, which is victoria-peltier.com. And they can figure if they want to link out and connect with me on whatever social media platform of their choice from there. Awesome. We will be sharing that in our show notes, as well as any other social links that Victoria wants to share with you all. As I say in every episode, folks, please, 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 Take what you heard today, leave what you don't want, but regardless, take one thing and think about an action you can take today, then choose to go and do that. Well, folks, thanks for joining us for yet another enriching conversation. To hear more about today's guests, make sure to check out the links in the description of this episode. Want to continue the conversation? Then head on over to our social media platforms, all of which are also linked in the description to keep it going. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to make sure you don't miss another valuable episode.